thank you for having me. It's really an honor to be here. I remember sitting in the audience at the first idea stream and getting a lot of advice for some, from some catalysts, from members in the community, um, some faculty, a lot of really smart people. And, uh, and it, it all made a difference, right? Because it does take an ecosystem truly to build a company. Um, I want to talk about commercialization because I think uh, there's a lot of extraordinary technology that gets created at places like MIT and uh, through programs like the Dishpande Center that help to bring these things to market. But the hard part, uh, from the gap from there to success, is figuring out how to commercialize. So that's going to be my focus today, is the commercialization. Let me give a quick background. I mean, Leon did a great job, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, I was an entrepreneur before I went to business school, but at business school, it was pivotal for me. I met Micah Rosenblum, who co-founded Brontes Technologies with me, and now is my partner at Founder Collective. So we've been working together for over 20 years. And David Frankel, who was actually our first investor in Brontes Technologies and then co-founded Founder Collective with me in 2009, the beginning of 2009. So met two people who changed my life. Um, we started Brontes. It, uh, I'll skip to the end. I'll, I'll ruin the story, although I'll tell you the story in a moment. We ended up selling it to 3M, as Leon mentioned, in 2006. Uh, it was a $95 million exit that, to me, sounds pretty modest in today's terms. Um, but back then, we found an article that said it was the sixth largest tech exit that year, which probably tells you a little something about it. Was that it was actually kind of a tough time in the tech market for that to be such a, a high on the list in that particular year. Um, the product we created and put in market had numerous years of growth. It's no longer in the market today. But the category we pioneered now has tens of thousands of units and offices uh, throughout the United States, and it's become a multi-billion dollar category. So we feel really good that what we thought could matter in the market one day really, really has. Um, in 2009, we started Founder Collective. We funded now over 300 startups at the seed stage. More than 20 of them have become billion dollar companies. So that's for us a marker of some really great uh, fortune and, and luck working with some terrific companies. And we've been the top rated fund on the Forbes Midas list for four of the last five years. Uh, and so we, we top rated seed fund, right? And that's really important to us because we do really early, we do seed stage and we do technology. And so, um, you know, that's the category we really care about. Okay, first, a little love to the Dishpande Center. Uh, Leon told you we were the first spin out. Um, luckily, they funded this incredibly attractive group of scientists back in, in 2002, I think it was, was the first grant. Um, and the reason they look cycloptic here, this was something Doug uh, designed, maybe against the will of the students who worked with him, um, was we created a monocular 3D camera, right? So it was a single lens 3D camera, so like one eye. So that tells you why they look so, so spectacular in this photo. But we were very fortunate that the Dishpande Center pointed them towards commercializing the technology um, because that meant that we met them and we got to get involved with them. Um, I want to make a caveat before I go into the Bronte story and the lessons and, and even the stories of, of our companies. These are some of our companies. I know Newbar was here last year from Flagship and Moderna. Um, first, I did not uh, solve the pandemic, so I, I, it's hard to follow his footsteps. But secondly, I think there's a huge difference between what's relevant in the learnings of innovation in biotech and what's relevant in the learnings and the innovation of tech. So I'm not going to talk about innovation in all contexts. I'm just talking about the technology, information technology, software, hardware fields. If you're doing material science, I hope some of these lessons are also very relevant, but it's a little further afield from my experience and obviously biotech's further afield from my experience. But um, so don't take these as rules of thumb. Don't take anything anyone says as rules of thumb that are true in every context, but we're gonna talk about hardware and software innovation. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about before I dive into Brontes is at the end of the day, you're solving problems for users. And people tend to overestimate the value of technology and underestimate the value of the user experience. User experience matters tremendously. And if you look at the last 20 years of the very best tech companies, Facebook, Netflix, Amazon, Uber, it's all about user experience. It's actually, yes, they have patents, but it's hard to say that their patents have been enabling of huge success. It really is about the experience they've created. So, it's hard to put the first solo transatlantic flight as a technological feat right next to sliced bread, but there's a reason we joke things are the biggest things since sliced bread because user experience matters and slicing the bread, pre-slicing the bread probably is what led to us all giving our kids sandwiches for lunch. I don't know if that's good or bad, but innovation comes in many forms and don't overlook the obvious. I have a couple more fun examples like that. Um, 
here we are at the, what was the 50K? We got our, our $10,000 check, uh, the big checks, very exciting to get. Right next to it is the product we ultimately brought to market with 3M, um, which, is, uh, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. Okay, and then one other thing I wanted to talk about is I love Bill Ouellette's formula for what is innovation. Um, I only heard this long after Brontes, but I thought, and I don't know if Bill's the one who came up with it, but he's the first person I heard say this, which is innovation is invention times commercialization. And Bill likes to say, the commercialization part is at least as hard and usually takes much longer. So you have to go in with that expectation, right? And I'm gonna talk about how we commercialize Brontes. So the gap between research and customer success is massive. And there's tremendous things you have to do, all of which I think are innovation in different ways through this entire stack, right? We had, and I'll show you on the next slide what it looked like, a general purpose platform technology when we started. That's not where we ended, as you can see here with the device that we built. Patents are useful our, for, our custom, for our venture back startups. We don't tell them don't get patents. But I don't think we have a single company in our portfolio where the patent portfolio was a key to their success, right? The, if think of a patent as sort of the research manifestation, the product of research, something innovative you did that you're bringing to the world in a, in a, in a patent, the distance between that and success in the marketplace, leap, you know, that could be dozens of years, right? It's a huge difference. Um, and in our world, patents, again, are, they're modestly useful. Right, so it's just very important to keep that sort of distance in mind. This is why the Responde Center is so important because I think it starts pointing towards solving all of these other elements of what makes for a successful company. Here was our pitch at the 50K, right? Imagine a device so simple, it can turn any 2D imaging device into a 3D imaging device. So you have to picture me 20 years long, younger saying that. Um, and then we say Bronte's technology because the world isn't flat. So the idea is we could put a component between a camera and a lens and make anything that's two-dimensional, three-dimensional. Sounds really cool. We really did go out to VCs pitching that as like a general purpose platform. Um, we got a lot of pushback. Okay, well, what do you do with it? We'd say everything. Why are cameras 2D? They shouldn't be 2D. We'd make this large scale, high level platform argument. And eventually we realized we needed to get more specific. So we started diving into all these applications, but we still wanted to do all of these applications. And if you kind of say, well, what's the best way to respect the technology? In a way, it would be to do all those applications because they're potentially possible, right? And you wanna do all the things you can do with the technology. So we had many, many applications, 27. These are actually ranked ordered. So you can see dental was not top of the list at that time. And I often say to entrepreneurs, if you're out looking for money and you're still pitching a list of things you could do, you haven't figured out what you're doing yet, right? You shouldn't have a list of things you can do. At some point, you have to figure out what you're doing. You have to get really deep at solving someone's problem. On the imaging side, we had this really cool doll that we can image. You can see it's not like super uh, beautiful, but we could image that. We could image a few other things. But we started bringing use cases back to the lab and saying like, Guidant has this stent that they'd like uh, quality controlled. So maybe we could 3D image that. And the, and the, the tech team would say, oh, that's really shiny. I, I don't think we could do that, right? Or uh, we'd start talking about teeth and they'd say, well, that's, that's kind of translucent. I, I don't think we could image that. We said, well, okay, well, for the 50K final, we're gonna do this awesome thing. We're gonna pan the audience and then show a 3D model in real time of the audience. And they were like, ooh, I, I don't think we could do that, right? And the reality was this technology that in theory could do everything couldn't actually do much at all. That's pretty normal, right? That's the beginning of this process. And until you know what you're designing for, a product for, it's really hard to get anything you um, are working on to actually do great stuff, right? And so we kind of needed to figure out what it was we wanted to image because it turns out imaging everything was not very practical. Um, ultimately, uh, we went out looking for money. We had a lot of trouble. This was the article you do not want written about your, your company when you're raising money. Um, Boston Business Journal totally like sideswiped us. They, they did this interview about how we were doing raising money. And then the bottom line of the article was since 2001, however, it was 2003, None of the 50K winners or runners up have landed VC funding from a major firm, though it's not as if they aren't talking to them, right? So we took meeting after meeting. They were all happy to talk to us. Nobody was funding us. And that was true of three years of the 50K competition. So it was a bleak time for raising money, at least for young entrepreneurs, right? And people didn't want to fund 20 something entrepreneurs and stuff out of labs. It was very hard to raise money in the, those days. 
um, ultimately, that actually helped us. It got us focused. Like we realized at some point we needed to actually get much deeper on what the commercial opportunity was. We started focusing focusing on the commercial opportunity that nobody wanted us to focus on, including ourselves, which was dentistry. Um, and that only came once we understood what was going on in dentistry and why this could be very valuable, which is we said 20 years ago, and I think it's still true, that it's the largest remaining cottage industry in the world where every unit of production is done by an artisan by hand. So we're talking mostly, we think of dentists, but we're talking mostly of labs, right? Crowns, bridges, implants, orthodontia, retainers, all done by artisans by hand, all singular units of production, totally customized for the customer, right? And CAD CAM had been coming into the industry, Invisalign had really been the leader there. There were a bunch in the crown and bridge side of the industry where they were actually uh, milling teeth for the first time. But the dental impression was the input to all of that digital process. And it was an analog input that was not very accurate. And what we wanted to do was actually create a digital input, scan directly from the mouth, much more accurate and direct to digital. And the idea was if you could do that, you'd flip the whole industry from cottage to mass customized, right? It took 20 years, but that really has more and more happened over the years. So we focused on dental. Janusz was the only one who joined the team full time. Um, he was critical to our success, but unfortunately we didn't have the whole technical team joining us. We had one member of the technical team. He became our chief scientist. Um, the core technology was the rotating aperture. It was that component. There was also key software, but this was the really big part of the story, if anyone remembers from the day. The rotating aperture was the thing that went between the camera and the lens that we could then embed ultimately into any camera system. And now that we were doing dentistry, we would embed into a much smaller dental camera. Well, turned out we couldn't get it to work. So we're a year into developing the technology. We had been funded to that point by VCs. We had a great VP engineering. We had a meeting that was like uh, one of these brutal meetings where he said at the end of the meeting, look, I, I'm not sure I'm supposed to say this, but I don't think this thing is ever gonna end up in the product. We've gotta figure out how to do the product without it. And I went to my office afterwards and I was a little dis disheartened by that, but Janusz was just devastated. And he walked back into my office with me and, and I was like, you okay? And he's like, I don't understand, Eric. We were funded to build the rotating aperture. And it took me a minute to like regroup and say to him, actually, we were funded to build value in the market for customers, in this case, for dentists. And if the rotating aperture gets us there, great. And if it doesn't, we focus elsewhere. And so we abandoned the core technology that our research had been based on. Um, all the patents that we had from MIT spoke to the rotating aperture, so none of those were relevant anymore. It was a very, very hard step. And I would say to anyone who's going through this process, you, you have to remember what your purpose is. Your purpose is not the technology, right? Your purpose is creating value for customers. And if the technology gets you there, great. But I've heard this story now from many, many uh, technology spinouts that ultimately the core tech was not what they thought it was gonna be, right? Now, of course, we learned a ton from developing this. So that helped us get to where we needed to go. Finally, we got an alpha device working. It was the first time we were able to scan teeth. Um, it was a little embarrassing though. The, the tip of the wand was so big that we joke like it was good for elephants, but not so great for people. Um, the, the, we had a LED ring light at the tip that was, would get so hot and overheat because we needed such bright light that we started running liquid cooling through it because we didn't want to burn anybody. And then here's Micah in our makeshift dental chair getting scanned and he would get drenched because the liquid cooling eventually would, would leak on him. So Micah was quite the sacrificial lamb. He was a good sport. Uh, and then this was the worst part. Um, we could not get the scanning to work on teeth because they were translucent. So we developed what we called sticky black. Clearly this was not something we could ever take to market, but at some point you gotta actually figure out if you can even scan teeth. So we created a, a, a patterning substance all based on food grade materials that um, stuck to the teeth and we could actually get dental scans off of. Clearly you cannot take this to market. There was no chance. By the way, it was really hard to get off. Like it took a nail scraping. It was crazy. Like first they were like, just rinse with Coca-Cola. Anyway, uh, that didn't work either. Um, so anyway, Sticky Black had its day. We did get past this, but a lot of what you got to do to get there is, is pretty rough. Um, then we learned that not only um, did dent, you know, did like the technology not work? We only got one member of the team. We couldn't rely on the IP. We had to use sticky black. The alpha was a mess, but dentists didn't really want scans. They wanted an end solution. So I talk about user experience. They wanted the full solution. Well, CAD CAM existed in the market, but they weren't used to 
finalizing the quality of a crown or a bridge or an orthodontic appliance without a model. And so they needed models. So we now had to innovate in 3D printing. And we didn't make 3D printers, but nobody had pushed 3D printers to the accuracy, uh, cost, and scale that we hoped to to make this work. Invisalign had actually proven scale, but they had 10 times the, ac the accuracy error uh, band for orthodontia than we had to have for Crown and Bridge. So we had to really innovate enormously here. It was a huge set of problems. Um, this problem has very much been solved since, but uh, that was a scary time for us as well. Well, so the, the, the quick end to the story you've already heard, you know, we, we sold the company to 3M. My, my joke at the time was the only thing we've sold so far is the company. Because like we can mistake invention for uh, innovation, we can also mistake productization for innovation, right? The full innovation includes getting it all the way to the customer and making it successful for the customer. And we didn't do that for another 18 months. I don't even say like we got it to market 18 months later. It was longer than that before the product was really successful for the customer. And you have to do all of those things. I mean, it was a great success story in that we had five bidders, 3M really wanted the company. We had shown them, we had reduced it to really truly a product, but there was a lot of work still to be done to make this successful in the market. Um, so due respect to 3M, I had to throw up one of their innovations here. Probably we all agree the personal computer is a bigger innovation than post-it notes. But I really learned at 3M to respect the customer journey, the customer experience in a whole new way because their, their whole theme is, uh, we thought we were so innovative at 3M, but their whole theme is ingenious practical solutions. And uh, there's a lot of beauty in ingenious practical solutions. And it turns out a low tack adhesive that leaves no residue that you can stick on walls and, and um, brainstorm together and put reminders turns out to actually be a pretty great customer experience, right? And that's the post-it note. So again, wouldn't overlook building great customer experiences, even if they don't seem as much of a technical breakthrough. Um, let me transition from the Bronte story. I'm happy to answer questions on it uh, at the end. Uh, to what we've done at Founder Collective since. So again, Founder Collective very much was born from Brontes, right? We returned 10x Dave Frankel's money. He was our first investor. Micah Rosenblum was my co-founder. He's, he's another partner at Founder Collective. And we started out to build the most aligned fund for founders at the seed stage in, in software technology, partially because in that time, we felt VCs were so misaligned to founders. And that seed stage was very poorly serviced. It's actually become very well serviced but very poorly serviced in those days. Here are some of our companies. I'm gonna use some of our companies as examples of what we've been learning or what we think we've been learning because as a VC, you constantly wonder, are you really learning? But what we think we've been learning about innovation at Founder Collective. So the first company I wanna feature is Verve Motion. Um, this is a company that's local. It's out of the Vise Institute, another technology licensing story. Uh, it's out of Connor Walsh's lab where a lot of what he does is robotics for human augmentation, exoskeletons and whatnot. The danger here would have been they easily could have come out and said, we want to build a, a, a human augmentation company and do all kinds of great human augmentation. Instead, they figured out who their customer was and they built to the final solution, right, for that customer that really matters for them, which is a backpack that allows warehouse workers to lift weights with four, lift boxes, but heavy weight with 40% less strain, right? These are workers who on average lift 30 to 40,000 pounds a day. Um, the strain issues are really high. The, the turnover is massive. The injuries are very common. It greatly reduces injury, greatly reduces turnover. And, and at the end of the day, people feel totally different than they feel without it. But what I love about this is, again, you got to know your customer. I'll give you an example of one of the things they've had to innovate around that doesn't seem like deep science. Everyone wanted to have their backpack every day. They didn't want to wear somebody else's sweaty backpack the next day. So one of the things that Verve Motion had to do was build lockers that had chargers so that their unique battery could get charged every night and the person would know which backpack was their backpack. It doesn't seem sexy, it's not deep tech, but to engineer to the experience that really matters to the user, they, that's something they had to do. Um, ideas are not companies, they're a start. Ideas are what motivate people and get them going. Um, Dave Frankel, my partner, met Bomb Kim in Harvard Square. He was a Harvard student at the time. Um, Bomb pitched him on doing Groupon for Korea. Uh, we had just, Dave and I had just had a meeting. This is early in the day. I don't know, people probably don't remember. There was a Groupon bubble where there were 150 Groupon clones. I don't, most people probably don't even know what Groupon is at this point, but group buying. And Groupon, I think today is worth like $200 million, right? But at one time it was billions and billions of dollars. 
and there are 150 of them. VCs thought the big wave of the future was group buying. Just like today, they think it's AI, just like last year we thought it was NFTs, just like, anyway, we'll talk about themes in a minute. But um, he met Bomb. We didn't want to do stuff in Groupon clones. Uh, we thought it was just not exciting. We thought it was completely overheated. He met Bomb. He's like, we have to do this. Bomb went to Korea, started building the company, shifted completely, and created the largest commerce company, e-commerce company in Korea. It has nothing to do with group buying. Um, it's really become the leading mobile commerce company in the world. You can, on your phone, order anything and have it in an hour uh, if you live in Seoul. Um, it's worth tens of billions of dollars, a public company today. But again, they, they started with Groupon. They ended somewhere that had some adjacency, but pretty different than Groupon. And so again, ideas are not companies. You gotta go through that whole process to build a company. Um, what are people really buying? We're Form Labs investors, that's pretty proud. MIT spin out, um, an awesome company. Um, but they didn't invent stereolithography, right? What did Form Labs do? Well, Form Labs made it way more accessible to buyers. It was way less. We actually used stereolithography at Brontes to create those models. Um, but we used $750,000 3D printers at the time. Form Labs makes a printer that's under $3,000 that has similar quality, smaller. It can be used at a desktop. It made it much more accessible beyond an industrial process. You can say, well, where was the tech innovation? I'd say it was everywhere. It was all over, right? How do you build a great high quality small printer? How do you put the right materials into it so that the users get out of it what they want? Great software and CAD tools, top flight customer service. If they keep wrapping, now there's lower cost competitors coming in under them that have actually scaled quite fast. But if Formlabs continues to innovate in all of these areas, they will continue to be a core leader in their market. Um, founders should love talking about the hard parts. So this is for the founders in the room who are gonna pitch VCs, but not just VCs. Like, talking to your catalyst advisors, talking to the VMS service, talking to whomever it is that can help you. You have to like talking about the hard parts. You can't just stand up and share vision, wave your hands and have no vulnerability. A lot of founders think if they say to VCs, well, we don't know the answer to that question yet, that that's gonna undermine their pitch. Actually, if they do it right, that's actually what's gonna make them trustworthy, but also it's gonna demonstrate how capable they are. This is, SeatGeek uh, is, is one of the largest secondary and primary ticket suppliers in the world. Hopefully a lot of people have bought on SeatGeek. Um, it's worth, it's a multi-billion dollar marketplace for tickets. Um, when we first met Jack and Russ, they were like 23 years old. It was 2010. Again, nobody wanted to back early, you know, people in their early 20s in 2010. Um, but when you started asking them about the hard parts of their business, they loved talking about it because that's all they thought about. And they wanted to engage on it and they'd admit they didn't have the answers yet, but they'd start talking about what they were doing and you'd listen to them and be like, well, they're 10 steps ahead of anyone else on how to solve these problems, right? And ultimately, that's, that's one of the things we really look for. Um, why is Uber valuable? So Janosch actually emailed me a few years back and said, congratulations on Uber. I think it was right around the IPO. We've been Uber investors from the start. He said, but honestly, did you think Uber would grow to be this big, especially because the barrier to entry is not that high, or so I think. Um, we heard that from so, by the way, I never expected Uber to get that big, so I don't mean to say that we did. We did invest, so we believed in it. Um, but I got that question from so many people. How hard is it to build a technology that's a mobile app that you push a button and a car comes to you? And I think it mistakes technology for value creation, right? The Because the, the, Jan is saying the, the barriers to entry are low. Well, maybe the technological ones are, although, by the way, not so easy either. But the true... Um, differentiator for Uber is, again, the experience of the consumer. What do I mean by that? Think of the, the barrier to entry as how long is the wait time for a ride? The lower that wait time is for the consumer and the lower the wait time is for that driver, the more value that's been created. So let's say one of us wanted to start Uber tomorrow, we could, our competitor, we could create a mobile app that showed a car coming to you, which by the way, at the time was a big innovation, and that you don't have to pay when you get out of the car, it's just all set, that, that at the time was a big innovation. But how long would the wait time be if we put 50 cars on the road? An hour? The average wait time. How long would it be even if we had 500 cars on the road? So the liquidity in the Uber ecosystem is part of what drives that experience, right? And so that, it, it, again, it's a great example of thinking of the user experience being the value, not, not the tech. Um, there's a saying in venture I've never liked very much that good lemons ripen early. Maybe I didn't like it because Brontes was over four years from spin out to even getting into the market.
But we've had at least three companies that have become multi-billion dollar companies that took at least five years to get to their first million in sales. Lots of great companies take time to ripen. Overcapitalization is a huge problem for that, by the way. If you take in tons of money and you start burning it fast, the patience with performance wears thin very quickly among the investors who wrote these huge checks. We advise companies, well, I'll talk more about this, but the dangers of too much capital. Airtable, by the way, is an incredible company. I recommend trying the software for any kind of workflow, uh, CRM, anything you're, you're, you can take non-technical people and they can build an incredible software stack for any, any organization using Airtable. Like you could run all these events, Leon, off Airtable. Um, but it was five years to their first million in sales and then it was a rocket ship from there, right? Sometimes it takes time. Um, people over themes. So VCs love themes. I mentioned NFTs and right now it's AI. And we've had just the comings and goings, you know, DeFi, um, uh, group commerce I mentioned before. There was a theme for a while called Solo Mo, which was social, local, mobile. And then we cluster like crazy around these themes. Well, this is an interesting data set we, we put together where we looked at Google searches for different terms that were the themes, right, of, of their time. And so a good example is like sharing economy, which was one of the hot themes around starting around 2012 through 2016. The two companies that defined that theme were Uber and Airbnb, right? They were the ones that really sparked sharing economy as a hot theme. Well, you can see from this, well, Uber and Airbnb were founded before 2010, and the theme became hot starting in 2012. So if you're a venture capitalist chasing themes, or by the way, if you're an entrepreneur chasing themes, you're probably too late, right? And so we try to invest in people and use cases, not themes. Right? So when people say, what's your crypto strategy? We're like, well, it's a lot of really interesting tech and crypto that we're interested in, but we don't actually have a thematic crypto strategy. And anyone that we would have would probably be way too late. We're looking for people, great entrepreneurs who have a place they want to go and a use case that merely matters to customers. Um, capital is not a weapon. Uh, we actually say it can be a weapon of mass destruction uh, for the company or mass suicide for companies. Um, people think the company that raises the most money is usually going to be the winner. We have seen over and over and again that is not true. So you need capital. You need enough capital. Too much capital is like eating way too much at the buffet. It does not work out well for anyone, right? And this is a great example. The Trade Desk, a company I wrote the first term sheet into. I'm still on the board of. It's a $30 billion public company now. We raised $6 million before going public. All of our competitors raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Almost all of them have been wiped out. The one that did the best sold for 1.6 billion. So, so we're worth 20 times what, what they were worth at exit. And at times we were very intimidated by the capital, but it turned out the capital actually led them to make some pretty big mistakes. And that's a longer story for another time, but you, you see this pattern again and again. We like to say venture capital can be deadly. We give out warning stickers. Um, you have to be very thoughtful about how you use their capital. Your dilution, is every dollar you spend that doesn't create more than a dollar of value. That's your dilution. It's not a financing that causes your dilution. Your dilution is every dollar you spent that doesn't create more than a dollar of value. So venture capital can be very dangerous. Um, and back to the simple, elegant things, the moon landing, clearly a way bigger technological marvel than wheeled luggage. But again, user experiences really matter. So don't overlook the obvious and what really might matter to customers. Because I would say like carrying your luggage around an airport really stinks. Um, so on that mind-blowing wheeled luggage note, uh, I'm happy to open it up to any questions. Great. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Eric. So we've got a couple of mics around the house here. And so what we'll do, if anybody has a question, raise your hand and somebody will come to you with a mic. And it's always tough to get the first one. I've been known to cold call. Well, I will, I will soon if, if nobody asks for one. Anybody have, there we go. Up in the front here. Oh, yeah. I was getting good. Thank you very much for a very insightful talk. Um, I was really uh, taken by your discussion about how ideas are not companies and how it's really creating sort of this customer experience, right? So we all think we have great ideas, but then to go from that to really understanding the customer experience is also a huge gap. 
right? Especially from, for example, researchers who are starting at the ground up. So do you have any suggestions or recommendations on how then you go about, especially if you have a small team, of trying to develop a product for a user or customer experience? Who would you reach out to? Yeah. How is that process you know, most effective? Yeah, I would say, so many great companies start with problems and then you start trying to design a solution. And typically when you're spinning something out of research, you sort of start with a solution and you're out looking for problems, right? But what I would say is if you can um, think about the technology you're working on and then say, but what problem related to this technology really energizes me? Like, do I think is really exciting and why? And then you go really deep in understanding that problem and, and what your solution has to become to solve that problem, right? Uh, which again is many, many layers of the stack beyond just a technology. But trying to marry those things by the, so, because a lot of what I think about is solutions can be motivations and, and, tech, and problems can be motivations, right? Like you're in a lab and you think you've discovered some incredible invention, that's a great motivation to go figure out what to do with it, right? And, or you see a problem in the world and you really wanna solve that problem, that's a great motivation. And then you've gotta figure out how you're gonna marry those two things together. And, and then you've gotta go really deep on that on that part. So the most obvious answer to that question that I actually don't think most people do that well is you got to spend a lot of time with the people who would be your customer, right? Really understanding where the pain points are. Um, and the pain point might be enabled by your tech, but it may be many other things like 3D printing that you're just going to have to do, even though it was never your tech in order to satisfy their need. Um, and you might have to come up for air several times and, and get, say, you know what, actually, this isn't the right solution for, right? We thought, first we thought everything, right? All 2D cameras become 3D cameras. Then we thought industrial inspection. We were on that for a while. There were a lot of things about that market that our technology was good for. And then there were a lot of reasons we didn't actually think that was such a great market to be in. So we came up for air again and said, okay, well, what else? And then we went really, really deep on dentistry. And some of it is you gotta kinda get a little shallow on a lot of things to figure out where to go deep on. But ultimately, if you don't have a, a really big problem you're trying to solve, um, I don't think the technology ever gets out in the world. Okay, I think Emiliano over there. Hi, Eric, Thank, very inspirational. Thanks a lot for taking us through. Um, you've shown us many sort of bullet points, many examples of what is in the journey of companies and what is important to look for. Could you tell us on, regarding your experience of all these, what is that the entrepreneurs have today learned best so they avoid it and what is still outstanding and they need to be aware and they haven't really come up to, to speed? So I would, um, <laughs> such a great question. So, you know, sometimes we look for a, a, a CEO to come into one of our companies. And if you hire a head of sales, to become a CEO, somebody who's been leading sales, they think sales is all that matters. And if you hire a head of marketing, they, it's not all that matters, but it's like the most important thing, right? If you hire a head of marketing, they think marketing is the most important thing. If you hire a, a product leader, they think product's the most important thing. Um, and I've seen all of those. And so wh wh what does that mean? It, it's the area that you're most comfortable with and you feel like you make the biggest contributions on tend to be the areas that you feel matter most. And, and I think for all of us, we have to get out of that mindset. We've got to remember it all matters. Like every part of this matters tremendously. And you almost have to separate yourself from the thing you're best at and, and learn quickly about all the things you're not as good at, um, giving them the respect that they need to succeed. So, you know, if I said, you know, if you come out of research and you want to build a company, you've got to really study the commercial piece because the idea that like you're going to build something and everyone's just going to want it, I mean, we, we've had a great portfolio. I've never seen that. Never. 300 companies. I've never seen something. I've seen stuff people want more than other things, but I've never seen something that just literally required no go-to-market effort. Just the world wanted it so much that it didn't need it. Right? So, so I, I guess it's just like moving to a very multidisciplinary approach to what it takes to build real value in the market. Otherwise, every part of it fails because the other parts aren't, aren't pulling their weight. Maven in the back. Well, thank you. 
Um, I look upon I a like gathering that. such as this as kind of group therapy. <laughs> And I think a struggle point for a lot of founders, particularly the research trained ones, is to make that jump from, if I could just do a little bit more in the lab, I could really perfect it. And you candidly talked about launching something and then finding out a rotating aperture, well, didn't quite do what you thought it would do, which theoretically was a technical risk that should have been caught in the lab. So what is the point or what is the advice for people who are sitting on that fence and saying, is it the time to jump to the entrepreneurial side and not keep doing more research? Ooh, such a hard question. I heard last night that the Shpande Center allows one miracle, right? You don't get two, you don't get three, you get one. I think ours was that we figured out how to overcome the rotating aperture. We had a lot of miracles, by the way, we were very lucky. But um, I think there is always this uh, desire for perfection, usually again in the discipline of comfort. And you've got to actually get beyond that, right? Like, I think you've got to get out of your comfort zone. And, and once you realize how imperfect all the other stuff is, you realize that, oh, the thing that I'm most comfortable with is actually way out ahead of all the other stuff. So maybe that doesn't need to be so perfect right now. But it's the same, like every product person, I mean, some are very well trained in this, but most don't want to let go of the product, right? And they, they're like not ready for people to see it. And most marketers are like, well, if we just... We just got to tweak the campaign a little bit more and get it here before we're really going to launch it. And, I, and, and the biggest thing is getting into an experimental mindset because this is the capital is a weapon problem is people think that they can take things to scale that don't work, right? That either the marketing doesn't work, the sales doesn't work, the customer success model doesn't work, the product doesn't even fully work. And we have a lot of companies in tech, we talk about product market fit. A lot of companies have raised tons of money and burned tons of money pushing into the market. They have meaningful revenue and they still don't have product market fit. Right, so it's a little complicated. What I'm saying there is you wanna keep everything quite lean in experimentation, but you want the market responding and teaching you, right? You're experimenting with the market constantly in all these different ways. And so I'd say if you're a researcher, one of the things you wanna do is like show what you've got, like come show the poster and get feedback and build a little more and get feedback and go talk to the customer and maybe the distance between where the research is and what would satisfy the customer is massive, but show them sort of a, concept of what it is, even if you can't show the tech yet, you know, what, what would it be? What would that concept be like so that you really can learn from them? Great. Okay. Um, Rabbi Afya, and then we've got, oh, you've got one back there and then Rabbi. So we'll get, get a I recommend um, The Lean Startup as a book uh, on that specific topic. It's a great, it's a great book. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I, Enjoyed the analogy of the buffet when you're talking about raising capital and thinking about how much to raise and not getting yourself in trouble. And I was curious, what do you think about when you, you know, it's easy to say, you know, have the right amount, don't have too much or don't have too little. Yeah. What are the things that you think about when you um, look at raising at any round? Do you think, okay, I want to en enhance value by this amount and yeah. think, or, or what are you thinking about when you? So, so a good, um, economic proxy would be that if you're going to raise money, which is very typical in tech, every 12 to 18, sorry, every 18 to 24 months, you want to double the value of that company every 18 to 24 months. One of the problems with raising a lot is usually it's at high prices and your progress in that 18 to 24 months almost never justifies doubling the value. And now you're kind of in a funny spot because new people who want to get excited about it either want to pay a lower price and they kind of know that that's going to be problematic. So they kind of shy away. Um, or, uh, well, really that ends up being the prime, or they need to sign up again to do the same thing, kind of overpay too much money. But it's that burn rate that ultimately is, is really the problem. That's the dilution. And so, you know, this figuring out what the right amount of money is, is really tricky. But at least in tech, I would say, it's very rare that more money buys more time. Everyone thinks it will. They think there's a discipline they, they will have, nobody else has, but they will have. And the reason it doesn't work out that way is people think, oh, you know, when the company spent a lot of money, it was very frivolous. It's not at all true. Companies spend a lot of money because there's many, many problems to solve in the company. And the incremental person helping solve that problem almost always makes sense, except when you have constraints. And those constraints help. So it turns out you burn less money in the same amount of time. Your exit burn rate is much lower. Your valuation setup for the next round is much better. And this overcapitalization causes acceleration against things that don't work yet because you're trying to prove so much so quickly to get the valuation where it should be. 
that causes irreparable harm. And we've seen many well-known companies that nobody likes to talk about anymore go down because of that. In fact, Boston in particular, I wouldn't say we're worse than others, but I can think of numerous billion dollar valued companies in Boston over the time I've been a VC that ended up going to zero for this exact reason. Right, uh, Ravi. Thanks very much for a great talk. Um, as a founder, oftentimes you're kind of laser focused on the problem and perfecting your technology and understanding your customer, but it seems like um, you may lose sight of opportunities that may be a big pivot for you to take advantage of. So, you know, with that mindset, you know, in your experience watching founders who have made big pivots, what are the things that, you know, allowed them to see that and to make a big decision, you know, for their team? It, it's such a tough question because um, you win through focus, right? The concentrate, I, I wrote, once wrote a blog post, that, the title of which was Startups Rarely Do Anything Well. And the idea is when you're a tiny little startup, it's so hard to do anything at a really high quality level that unless you concentrate all your focus at doing it better than anyone else, doing something very specific, better than anyone else in the world, you're probably never gonna do anything that's really world-class. Um, and yet, sometimes companies have to pivot, right? And so what I'd say is if you're very experimental and you keep getting back the feedback that you don't want, right, from all these experiments, that's kind of a good moment to pick up your head and look around and say, is there something smarter we should be doing here? How different? Well, it depends on the company. Sometimes a pivot is a sort of small, I mean, the idea of basketball pivot, right, is actually not a huge thing. You talk about Twitter, right, was, was a podcasting service that became Twitter. That's like, that's not a pivot. That's like a, a you know, like a long jump. Um, but, and sometimes that's the right thing to do. They were basically ready to give up. So, and, you know, and Jack Dorsey had this idea and they were like, okay, why don't we try it? So, you know, it, I guess it depends in some sense um, how much you're uh, convinced what you're working on just is never going to get there. And then what, what you could imagine is next. But the other thing I'd say is, but you do have to have your antenna up all the time for the opportunity because you're trying to use all that experimentation to find what matters to your customers. And so sometimes those pivots are just tiny little shifts but they make all the, like we realized we needed to get involved in 3D printing, right? That was a pivot in a way, but it wasn't a huge, it wasn't like we were servicing a different customer with a completely different product. It was just, we had a gap in our offering and we knew, we, we became convinced that without solving that problem, people wouldn't buy our product. Okay, any, any other questions? One more back there. And Hi, um, thank you. I really liked your talk a lot. Um, one question I have is when you're kind of looking at a problem, for example, um, I guess I come from a mindset of like the medical space, for example, there's actually a lot of different people that are involved. And sometimes you have to think about like which person is actually the customer, whether that's in the medical pathway and things like that. So I have a question about, yeah, like how do you come to this idea of like when you're in this early stage, like who is my customer? Um, yeah, uh, well, so um, <laughs> I would start by saying that is the most important question that you need to be pursuing. I think the challenging thing in the medical world, and uh, this also happens a lot in like enterprise software um, and government, you know, the buyer is not the same as the user. And they're both your customers and you somewhat have to figure out um, who you need to serve first. Because it's very rare you can do a brilliant job serving everybody. And in different cases, um, the, the same company could succeed maybe in either direction. So PillPack was one of our companies and they really went at it by serv servicing the user, right? The user experience of taking five or more drugs a day um, was terrible and they made that way better. And they made the whole thing about that, but it almost, they almost got taken down by the payers um, because they didn't solve them. The payers didn't like them, right? And the payers also had a big conflict. Um, but because the end user liked them so much, they were able to overcome that. They actually, uh, it, you know, literally the end users, the, the, um, the patients were, were so upset that it made it hard for the PBMs not to pay for pill pack. Um, so, but you could imagine it going the other way too, that if you solve some problem for the PBMs related to how you package drugs or whatnot, uh, pharmaceuticals, that, that might've been what pushed it out to the end users. So, I, but you usually have to figure out who you, who you serve first and foremost. Um, it's part of the reason why most enterprise software is so bad, 
it's gotten a lot better. But part of the reason it's so much worse than consumer software historically is the buyer was often the administrative leadership that was much more worried about security, compliance, all of these different things than the end user experience, right? And we've gone into a phase now where it's BYO, right? All, all of the software in the enterprise now are things that, you know, a, a random person in the enterprise signs up for and then it just runs out through the enterprise like Slack, right? So, so those companies took a totally different approach, right? Bottoms up approach to the end user. So you, in theory, can go in either direction, right? But Oracle is not bought by the end user, right? It's so. All right. Um, looks like we, we have come to the end of the questions. Either that, oh, one more over there. Sorry, Malcolm. I knew we could always count on Malcolm for the last word. <laughs> so um, thanks for the talks, excellent. Um, I've done both software startups and deep tech startups, and I perceive they're really quite different, although a lot of what you've talked about today is generic. But how do you see the difference in process between those two? Well, we, we talked about it a little bit uh, a few questions ago, right? Which is this starting with a solution looking for a problem versus starting with a problem looking for a solution. Or it's a different um, process of innovation, right? And, and Brontes was on one side of that. We were very much a solution looking for a problem. And I would say Uber that we invested, you know, as an investor was the opposite, right? There was a problem largely focused in San Francisco of how hard it was to get a taxi. By the way, in Boston too, it was pretty terrible to get a taxi. Um, and, uh, and somebody wanted to do, Travis Kalanick and Garrett Camp wanted to, and Ryan Graves wanted to do a better version of that. So I would say that's a big, big difference. Um, but I'd say like, uh, I, you know, again, I, I have never done materials and I've never done biotech. And so I don't want to speak to those industries. Um, but I think there is a lot of deep tech that is very, very enabling that touches the world of software and hardware that I'm from. Um, that is incredibly analogous um, to the experience we had at Brontes, realizing that it wasn't the tech that primarily was the differentiator in the market. It mattered, but, but it was that experience of the end user that really, really mattered. And I think trying to connect those things, but again, if it's about a molecule, I think that's a totally different, with a market that's completely known, right? That's a completely different thing, right? And so if we know that COVID, a pandemic is happening and you're, um, Moderna, and you think you can use your platform to solve the pandemic, it's the, you have an absolute, guarant, almost guaranteed known outcome if you can actually make the tech work, right? That's not true in most of what we do, right? We didn't even know at Brontes, if we could scan the mouth, would that be something customers would care about? We did a lot of work to try to validate that, but we weren't going to know until whatever it was, five years later, when we finally brought it to market and started trying to sell it. So it, it's it's sort of it's a there are some very different risks in in um, sort of the hardware and software world versus the biotech world. Not to say there isn't tremendous risk in the biotech world; they have plenty of risk as well. Yep. Right. Okay. Well, Eric, thank you very very Pleasure. much. Thank you really all. Appreciate it. And um, by the way, um, just just a little bit of trivia and side note. Now, Connor Walsh, who did Verve, do you know that Connor was a uh, was either PhD or postdoc on a Dishbande project did not before he went to Harvard. I mean, it did not go to market, but who knows? Maybe he learned something valuable while he was here. Well, thank you for that as well. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much.